Okay, so ready? Let's get going. Uh, we started just barely talking about two new vector field operations last time, curl and divergence. And we're going to kind of push through this section pretty quick so we can get into 13.6. Um, we said that if you're given a vector field, that we have these new two, two new operations we can do, curl and divergence. One of them results in a vector. The other one results in a scalar. So I did not show you the formula for, um, for curl, but here's what it is. All right? We looked at it geometrically, but now let's talk about the actual computation of it. So if f is a vector field, three-dimensional, uh, p, q, r are the component functions of the vector field, and the partial derivatives exist. So you can take partial derivatives. Um, then the curl of f is defined to be this right here, which is, some, is somewhat difficult to remember. All right. So instead of remembering this entire formula, we can look at it as using this notation and this formula instead, which is much easier to remember. Now, do you all remember what the gradient is? The del operator, the gradient, we usually had to say like the gradient of f. And when we said gradient of f, that meant you took the partial of f with respect to x, then partial of f with respect to y, and partial of f with respect to z, and you, you created a new vector from that. That's, so the del was like an operation. And what I'm saying, this notation says, if you take the del operator, and you cross it with the f vector field, then we mean this. Now, remember cross products? I showed you how we can do a pro cross product way back in the beginning by lining up your i, j, and k components and then doing the determinants. Remember that thing? Well, check out this, this thing that we're going to do deter the determinants on. Notice that the del vector is actually the differential operators. So it's saying, you. When you put del in here, you're saying the first component of del is telling you take the partial with respect to x. Then the second component is saying take the partial with respect to y. Then take the partial with respect to z. Of what? Well, it depends on when you do your cross product and you do the determinants, what it is you'll be taking partials of. So how did we get the i component of a cross product? How do we get the i component? We cover it up, right? And we do the determinant of the remaining two by two matrix. So this would be this times R. Now this is what I'm saying. This is weird notation. Del with respect, um, partial with respect to Y of R, this is not multiplication. It's not this times this. What we mean is take the derivative with respect to Y of this. The traditional determinant is just multiplication, right? So this is purely notation to help us remember how to do it, all right? Because this is really not defined. This times this doesn't make sense. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? If I say take, take the derivative, right? And then I say f. If I say take the derivative times f doesn't make sense. Take derivative of f, of f take, makes sense. So that's what we really mean here. So this first part would be um, this which would be partial of r with respect to y, then minus because determinant, partial of q with respect to z. And then when we cover up the j component, we do the determinant again, but we change the signs, which gives us this. And then the last one would be covering up k. Understand? So it's, it's just a notation. It's a way to remember curl of f is del cross f. Del cross f. That's it. So that's what I'm saying here. This right here, del, is called a differential operator. So let's do this problem. So let's find the curl of this vector field over here. So I'm going to um, make sure you Understand that PQR for us, it's x squared yz, xy squared z, xyz squared. So I'm asked 
to find the curl of this vector field and then find the curl and the magnitude of the curl at a specific point in the vector field. So first we find the curl. So the curl of F, which we write curl F, is equal to del cross F, which for us is this thing, I, J, K. The differential operator is del, so I put partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z. And then I put in the f, which is x squared yz, xy squared z, xyz squared. And now I, I do that cross product. So my i component will be, I cover up the i, and I do my little partials across here. So what's the partial with respect to y of this one right here? xz squared. I subtract from that partial with respect to z of this, xy squared. Okay, now the next one, I cover up the j, and I do my determinant, but then I change the signs. So it'll be partial with respect to x. Um, of this, which is yz squared, but then I'll subtract it, right? So I'm going to put it like this, subtract yz squared. And then it would have been minus this partial with respect to z of this, which would have been xy squared, but then subtract. So I'm x squared y, yes. Um, x squared y, I said xy squared, x squared y. And then my last one, I cover up K and then do my partial. So what, Y squared Z minus X squared Z. That makes sense? That's my curl. My curl is a vector. Now let's actually determine what the curl is at a specific point. So the curl of F at the point 2, 1, 0 is going to be equal to a vector. So plug in uh, 2 for x, 1 for y, 0 for z. Negative 2, then 2, and this is 0, so 2. And then here just zeroes out, right? All the z's are zeros. Is it 4? 2 squared. We all agree? And then now the magnitude of the curl. So the magnitude of curl of F at that point, 2, 1, 0, is equal to square root of 4 plus 16 plus 0, so root 20. And that's it. Not much more to that. Find the curl of this one. And the magnitude. What do you uh what do you notice here? It's two-dimensional, right? This vector field is two-dimensional. In order to define the curl, we have to be able to do a cross product, which means we need three-dimensional. So what we do is we extend this vector field into three dimensions as follows. We redefine f of x, y, now z to be equal to the vector 0, negative x squared, 0. So what we're doing is we're adding a third component to our vector field, but we're making it 0 which means it has no, no impact. It's the same as flattening everything down into two-dimensional space, but we have that third component there now. So now we just do our curl. It'll be equal to del cross F. 
which is i, j, k, partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, partial with respect to z, and then we have 0, negative x squared, 0. There, a lot of things here are going to zero out, right? So what's my i component? Should be this, minus this, and that's going to be 0. My j component, cover this up, 0 again. And my k component, negative 2x, and that's it. I'd like for you to pay attention here to the fact that our curl is a vector that only has a z component, which means if you were to look at this vector, if it has a zero for x and y component, then, you know, remembering our room is like the x, the y, and the z, that the curl at any point for this, right, vector field is pointed parallel to the z-axis. Right? This is a vector that's parallel to the z-axis, straight up or possibly pointing straight down. But it has no x and y component. So remember, the original vector field was two-dimensional, wasn't it? Our curl is coming out of our two-dimensional space. So if it's like a sheet of paper and our vector field's on the sheet of paper, our curl must come out towards us or go into the page for this vector field. Now, what I was trying to get you to see, oh, magnitude. What's the magnitude of that? Curl of F would be the magnitude, right? 2x. Sorry, that's it. Because it's the square root of 4x squared, right? Which is the absolute value of 2x. Because, look, your magnitude is going to be positive. So you could plug in negative uh, values of x and make that negative. That's why you need the absolute value around it. All right, now I did show you this last time, in a geometric interpretation of this. Can anybody explain to me geometrically what curl is? It's, so it's like a rotation that's happening. So some, you're in your vector field. You're looking at it like a molecule within this, let's say, water, f flowing water. And the curl is a vector. So what does that vector represent? What does the, what does the curl vector represent? So my hand is the particle. OK, so what is that vector? That's right. It's my axis of rotation. So this particle wants to rotate, right? Because the things around it, the way the field is, it wants to rotate. The curl vector is my axis of rotation. Does that have anything to do with the direction in which my particle wants to go? Does the curl vector have anything to do with where the particle is headed? No, right? The curl only tells me that even if I'm headed up towards the projector, right? that this thing is curling, turning as I'm going that way, okay? And this gives me my axis of rotation. The magnitude of the curl is how quickly I am turning, All right? That's what I was trying to get to with this thing, is that in three-dimensional space, the red vector is my axis of rotation. How quickly that disk is turning is the magnitude of that vector, and so... That gives, you know, that's the geometric representation of the curl. Now, we just said, by the way, that's the vector field. This right here is this vector field, okay? That's the vector field. And what did we find at, at 2, 1, 0? Let me see. Let's see if I can make this. 2, 1. Actually, I don't know if this is the same vector field. My guess would be that when I wrote this code, I used the same one I did in the example. What was our curl when we did it? Negative 2, 4, 0? Yeah, maybe it's not the same vector field. Oh, well, hold on. I have it up here. 
Huh. Well, let's not get bogged down with it. Square root of 20, right, was our... Did we get... We got negative 240. Did we get our curl right? Was that the same vector function? No. Okay, well, let's not get bogged down. I just want you to see it geometrically. Now, the other one that we just did, right? The other one, the vector field was 0, negative x squared. And we said that the curl of that is a vector, and the vector was 0, 0, negative x squared which we said came out of the page, right? Either out of the page or into the page. So do you see why now, if our curl vector is coming out of the page, then that's our axis of rotation, then our curl represents this turning, which is why I'm representing it with that wheel. It's like a paddle wheel. And then the things around it are dictating which way it's rotating and how fast it's rotating. So here the vectors to the left are moving, the particles to the left, right? The molecules here are moving faster than the ones here, so the net result is that there's a twisting motion, right, in the counterclockwise direction. But if I move my... Move it over, now it's the other way around. So now my curl is negative. I'm, I'm rotating that direction, clockwise, instead of counterclockwise. All right, so that's curl. We said that if the curl is zero, then there is no rotation, right? If your curl is zero, there's no rotation. And the field is, is called irrotational. We saw that if our field was two-dimensional, we can always extend it into 3D by just throwing in the zero component for, for the Z. Or for the, yeah, for the PQR, we just make R zero, and then we're done. All right, now, the value, one of the values of curl is that you can check to see if a function is conservative. We said back um, in 13.3.3 that if we had a two-dimensional vector field, we could always check to see if it was conservative by doing this quick check. And we saw that that actually had to do with Green's theorem, too, right? That kind of came from Green's theorem a bit. But now we have this, this property of curl. It says um, if you have vector field, three-dimensional vector field, the partial, continu the partial derivatives are continuous, then if we look at the curl and it comes out to be zero, by the way, this should be zero vector, right? The curl is a vector. So the curl can't be zero. Cur curl is a zero vector. So that's zero vector. Then F is a conservative vector field. All right, next, divergence. This is the other operation on vector fields. If you've got PQR again, the partial derivatives exist, then the divergence of F is defined to be this. Div F is partial P with respect to X plus partial Q with respect to Y plus partial R with respect to Z. This is just going to give you a number or a scalar. It's not going to be a vector. And then we can also use this other notation that div f is del dotted with f. Remember when you dot product two vectors, you get a number? Well, with this notation, if del is the differential operator, if I dot that vector, right, if I dot that vector with pqr, so imagine coming in here and dotting this with pqr, right? then the dot says you do this times this, this times this, this times this. But times didn't make sense, but it's just notation. So this means partial with respect to x of p plus, because it's dot product, partial with respect of q with respect to y, partial of r with respect to z, and add them together, and that's this. So it's, again, a convenient notation for divergence. So curl f is del cross f, 
divergence f is del dot f. So what's the divergence of this? We also say instead of divergence, we'll say div f, just div f. Um, div f is very easy to compute. You can usually do it all in one line without even doing much work. Like the, the curl, you have to do the cross and make sure you get everything correct. But here, you just look at each of the components and do your partial with respect to x, then y, then z, and add them up. So what's the partial of p here with respect to x? To x, y, z. And then we add to that the partial of the second one, right? with respect to y, the second component, so we just get 2x, y, z again, and then again 2x, y, z, which is just 6x, y, z. So what's the divergence at the point 2, 1, 0? You just plug 2, 1, and 0 in, you get what? 0. At 2, 1, 0, you get that the div of f equals zero. So if the vector field represents the velocity field of a flowing fluid, then divergence measures the tendency of the fluid to diverge or leave a point in the fluid. Given a point x, y, z, and r3, if the div is positive, then the region around the point is called a source point or a source. If the div is negative, then the region around the point is called a sink. If the div is zero, then the region around the point is called incompressible. I don't know if I showed you this one, but this is a good this is I think this is a good representation of what div is. Okay, you see that circle, right? Imagine that that's like an infinitesimally small circle. So infinitesimal, right? But I'm going to blow it up so it's easier to see. You've got, if we look at this infinitesimal circle, then there's, there's vectors pointing into it and there's, there's vectors pointing out of it, right? For every point inside the circle, everywhere, there's vectors. I just, I'm just going to look on the edge of the circle, though, all right? Just the edge. Then you've got vectors on, on the edge. If I look at just those and any of the vectors that are going in to the circle, like these red ones are pointing into the circle, right, would represent something trying to go into, this, into the circle from the outside going in, right? On the other edge over here, there's green ones going away, right, leaving the circle. And... Notice that because the vector field, the ones, the red ones are longer on this end than the green ones are on this, on the other end, right? So the net result is that there's more going into the circle than there is leaving it, right? More going in than leaving it. The red is negative, the green is positive. So the red outweighs the green here, so your divergence is negative. There's more going into it than leaving it. Does that make sense? So we call that we would call that a sink because things are trying to go in. A net result is that things are going in. Now, of course, the circle is not that big. The circle is infinitesimal, and we're talking about all the vectors, not just a few on the outside, right? We take all the vectors, and you start to fill everything up. It, we're still saying there's more red than green. Got it? What's this? I'm just playing with this now. Oh, that's where you can zoom in. Zoom out. Now let's let's change the vector field. Look at this one. 
That vector field look familiar? Zero negative x squared. What's the div of this? What's the div of this vector field? Well, it's the partial of the first one with respect to x, which is zero plus the partial of the second one with respect to y, which is zero. The div should always be zero, no matter where you are. And look at the picture, kind of illustrate what's, what's happening here. You've got red ones going in, but see the ones on top have the same length as the green ones coming out the bottom. So the net going in is equal to the net going out, right? So they cancel each other out. And so what you get is, is nothing, right? Zero. And so it's, it's not a sink, it's not a source, it's what? What do we call it when div is zero? Incompressible. I mean, you, you try and think about it as like flow of stuff. If you can get, like in the previous example, if, if more is going in than coming out, right, then you can imagine like compressing it, pushing more into a smaller space, I guess you could say. But if div is zero, then the amount you push in must also get pushed out. So you cannot compress it. That make sense? Also, it should not matter where I move in the vector field. All that happens here is my vectors get longer, but again, they're the same length going in and out. So there's, it's because of some of the symmetry of our vector field that that's happening. Now, if I change my vector field to, let's say, this one, xy sine xy, then I've got div that does vary. Zoom in on that. Right? Div is negative 1. More going in and out. Now, this is all two-dimensional, right? I could give you the same idea three-dimensional. But in this, uh, in, this, in this picture, you're on the edge, the, you're on the, edge of the surface of this ball, right? There's, in this case, it looks like there's more green going out than there is the red going in. And it's, you can tell the div is calculated to be 1.7 here. I think this makes more sense in terms of compressible because it's three-dimensional. All right, so that's, that's the geometric idea behind div. Now, because of this, we have some cool results for theorems or formulas that we've seen before. So what was, what was this theorem or, or what was this uh, integral? Do you remember what this integral was here? Line integral f dr. F dr. No. It's... What's line integral f dr? Well, okay, what's Green's theorem, right? This is the... We, we're calling this the vector version of Green's theorem. What was Green's theorem? By the way, I'm going to print out a formula sheet summary for you. I just didn't get a chance to do it. It's like eight to ten pages of, of all the formulas from Chapter 13. Yeah, just for you to have, and you can use it on the exam. But it's, it's all nice in one place and something you can take to another class and have. Um, line integral over C of f dr. This is work, isn't it? This is work. That's what we use for work. Green's theorem said that this is equal to the double integral over d of, do you remember? Okay, partial q with respect to x minus p with respect to y. DA, right? That's what it was. Now, of course, there were conditions, right? Like C had to be a closed curve, simply connected curve in the positive orientation, right? All these different things had to enclose the solid D, right? But we could do a line integral, right, over a closed curve and convert it to a double integral over the region D that it encloses, right? That's what Green's theorem told us. But we're saying here with this, that we could also write that that way, right? Well, look at this. 
that right there is supposed to match up with whatever curl of f is dot k. That's the only difference in these formulas, right? Curl, curl of f dot k should be this part. Well, what's curl of f? Let's go back to what curl of f is. And let's look at the ugly formula for it. Here's curl of f. And I said you could memorize this formula, or you could just do the cross product. Well, let's just look back at the formula. Had we done it, had we looked at this. If I take curl of f and I dot it with k, what's k? K is the, is, it's actually k hat. What's, what's k hat? What's that vector? I hat, j hat, k hat? Isn't k the vector 0, 0, 1? Yes? That's k? I is the vector 1, 0, 0? 0, 1, 0 is j? That's i, j, k? So if I tell you to take k and dot it with this, then the only thing that appears is what? That last k, that, that k, the z component of the curl is the only thing that appears, right? It's this one times zero, this one times zero, and then that one times one, which is just partial q with respect to x minus partial p with respect to y dA. It's just a different form of the same, same exact formula, right? That's why they called it, that's why, I call, that's why we called it the vector version of Green's theorem because we replaced that thing in there, which was partial derivatives, with vector stuff. Curl of f, that's a vector. Dot it with k, that's a vector. It's a vector version of the same thing. And then there's another formula that we can use, another uh, vector version of Green's theorem. It was this, f dot nds. Now, for this one, I'm going to have to go back for a second. Um, let me see if I can find this. 13.3, no, It's this right here. We had this way back when. We said this was work, right? F vector field f dot dr. And then this is the formula that we used when we were actually mo uh, like mechanically figuring out answers. And then this was another version of it that we didn't get into, where t is like a tangential vector. And so this last form of Green's theorem is rewriting that with, this is the, n is the unit normal vector to the curve C. So this is kind of like the T is, but this right here is div F. So what is div F? Partial, Partial with respect to x, par partial of f with respect to x, plus partial of f with respect to y, plus partial of f with respect to z. Now look, the two; these are just two new versions of Green's theorem, all right? We will use these later. We're going to use them. Right now, it's just to show you how we can use the notation of div and, and curl and still be uh, doing Green's theorem. So for now, just, re you know, don't worry about this too much, like, just that it exists, and we will refer back to it, all right? All right, now there's a bunch of relationships with div and curl. Um, I'm just going to put this up here. I'm not going to go through this. I'll just tell you what's going on, and then you can go back and look at this if you want yourself. This is a good exercise. There's some problems in the book that I give you for homework to practice this. Um, it's kind of like, remember in pre-cal, where you had to verify identities? like verify the identity, blah, 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 and they, you would have to try and show the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Okay, this is like the same thing, 
but with these um, div and curls. So this one says, if you take the div of the cross product of two vector fields, it's equivalent to taking the G vector field dotting it with the curl of F minus the F vector field dotting it with the curl of G. So what you do is you start with one side, like what's the div of F cross G? Well, that's del dotted with F cross G. What's that? Del crotted with, um, cross with, ah, del dotted F cross G is this. And then they work through it. Okay, I'm not going to go through all this. And then at the end, they get, let's see, it starts here. This line right here is G, because it's P2, Q2, R2. That's P, Q, U, R. That's G multiplying each of these components, but each of these components makes up the curl of F. So this line right here is G dot curl F, and then minus this line right here is F, P, P1, Q1, R1, times the curl G, or dotted with curl G. You, you just have to mess with these, all right? I won't give you that on a test that you would sit in class and do, because they take too long, and you could spend you know, an hour trying to make it work out. But they're, they're good exercises. So there you go for that section. 765, I doubt that's the right page. Oh, no, not even close. 795. And one, two. I would like to offer everybody, well, I don't even know if I'm going to say this is an offer. We, I'd like to get another quiz grade in. Uh, we've had some in-class quizzes. We've had the take-home quizzes. You have one more take-home quiz that's due, right? What I'd like to do is on the day of the final, I'd like you to bring me in your homework that you've done this semester. So I know that, you know, at least some of you have been doing your homework and have doing all the problems and been keeping track of it and keeping it all in one place. If you bring that homework in to me on the day of the final, I'm going to consider that for a quiz grade. And I'm just going to thumb through it. I'm just going to get an idea of what it looks like you put in as far as effort into the homework assignments and then base a quiz grade on that. The idea, though, is not that you go back now and do all the homework that you were supposed to be doing all semester, all right? So for those of you who've been doing it and keeping up with it, it should be an easy 100. Um, and it doesn't have to be every problem had to be done. It's just an, you know, an honest effort at the problems. If it's in different places, that's OK. Just as long as I can, I can see what you've been doing, all right? Sound fair? OK. Um, so bring that on the day of the final. We are moving on to the next section, which is 13.6. All right, parametric surfaces and their areas. I have a handout that I'm going to give you. We're going to work through this handout today. But uh, before I do that, let me just try and motivate the idea of what we're doing. And yeah, let me start with these notes. Okay, remember that in 10.7, we defined vector functions. And we said, okay, if we take a function, which we call r of t, the vector r of t, and we have a two-dimensional or three-dimensional vector where each of the components is some function of t, and we let t take on different values, then we're going to draw curves. It's either going to be a two-dimensional curve like this, you know, where all the vectors, the red are all the vectors, and where they point to draws us a curve, right? So this is the curve, you can't see it down there, uh, t squared and then 1 minus t cubed, right? That's, that blue curve represents that vector uh, function. If we do a three-dimensional vector function, we can get something like this, spiral, right? We did all that in 10.7. 
Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to try and, and throw something else into this. Instead of just having a variable t, where t varies, you know, like time, usually it was like time, instead of having one parameter t, we're going to define a function to have two parameters. And instead of using like t and some other letter, we're just going to start using u and v. So u and v are now our parameters. And we are going to define a new vector function that is dependent on two numbers, u and v. You give this function two numbers, and it is going to spit out a three-dimensional vector. Each of the components of those vectors, um, the x component, y component, and z component, are both functions of those two parameters, u and v. If we do this and we let u and v take on all the different values that are actually defined for each of those functions, if we let them take on all these different values, we'll generate a surface in three-dimensional space. A surface, not a curve. The u, x, uh, sorry, the uh, x, y, and z components right here are called the parametric equations of the surface. And you've done one of these. You're about, we're about to look at one. If we hold u or v constant, right? So right now we're saying u and v are two parameters. If you hold one of them constant and let the other one be a parameter, then what should it draw? A curve, right? And if I hold the other one constant and let the other one change, I'm going to draw another curve, right? So if we hold either of those um, constant, we draw curves in space. Um, when we hold U or V constant in the space, we get these things called um, a grid curve of the surface. So let's look at this example. This should look familiar to you. Anybody recognize? Think about the parametric equations. The parametric equations are X is this, right? Y is this and z is this, right? Does anyone remember when it was that we did x is that, y is that, z is that? And then look at my restrictions on, on the u and the v. I'll give you a hint. It was one of our three-dimensional coordinate systems. What are our three-dimensional coordinate systems? Got Euclidean. Spherical and cylindrical, right? Do you remember this being our spherical? We used theta and phi. Do you remember that? I stood in the corner of the room and I said, if I want to get to the projector, I can give you a, well, we pointed always straight up and we go, give you a theta, give you a phi, and then give you a radius. Yes, you remember that? Or rho, we called it rho, not radius. Do you agree that this is, rho is 1, and then this is our conversion. X was equal to rho sine phi cosine theta, and then sine phi sine theta. Do you, do you remember this? You have to go back in your notes. It kind of ring a bell a little bit, spherical coordinates. So what I've done is I've created a vector function where each of the parametric equations are the conversion that I made from one coordinate system to the other. What will happen if I start drawing this? So if I let u be a constant, right? Let's let u be a constant. If u is a constant, then that's a constant right there, right? And this is a constant right here. And this is a constant, yes? But cosine v sine v is not a constant. And what would cosine v sine v draw? A circle, right? So I would have a circle. The x and y co uh, coordinates would be changing with respect to a circle. My z component is going to stay fixed. So look, if I hold my u constant and let my v variable change, do you see I'm drawing a circle? but my z component is staying fixed, my up and down stuck. Do you all see that? My up and down is stuck, but I'm drawing a circle this way. Yes? Understand that? Now also, going back here, my sine u 
my sine v was a constant, but because it's a constant, couldn't we look at that as being the radius of that circle that I just drew? So that's why when I come back here, my circle, if I look at it from the top, has a certain radius to it, right? If I now change, if I now change what u is, that's going to change that radius, isn't it? Now, unfortunately, I don't have the picture for that, but I'll come at it from the top. You can see... you can see that it's drawing a circle, but that radius is bigger than that red one was. And it's a little lower than it was before, isn't it? It's, it's down below it, so my z's changed. So by holding u constant, I'm drawing all these circles up and down, right? But they're changing radius, they're changing their radius as I move up and down, yes? Now if I hold the v constant and let u change, what what's going to happen? Well, let me let me get you back up there. Let me move my v right there. So I'm going to let my v be constant and let my u change. I'm going to draw little half circles. Let's see if we would have got that from this. If if v is constant, this is a constant, right? Yes. V being constant here. Cosine u is not a constant, isn't it? So look, I'm drawing, I'm drawing circles, but I'm drawing them. What am I holding constant? Sorry, I forgot. V, right? Sine u, cosine u is now the x and the z, right? The x and the z. And then the y, the y coordinate, right, is what? sine u. So it's, it's changing. The y coordinate left and right is changing as a function of u also. So going back over here, get this half circle. Anyway, we put them all together, all the grid curves, and you get this, which is your sphere. So you can draw a sphere with the vector function. Right? You can draw a sphere. But listen to what I just said. You can draw a sphere with a vector function. That's different because normally we have what for a sphere? The equation of a sphere. Yes? The equation of a sphere. X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared equals R squared is, is the um, equation of a sphere at the center, center at the origin, radius R, right? But it's not a function. Because it fails that whole idea of like a, almost like a vertical line test type thing, it fails it. But this is a function. It's just like we can draw a circle and say a circle is not a function of x and y or y because it fails vertical line test, right? But if we draw it with, with a vector function, r of t equals the vector function cosine t sine t, and restrict our t, t between 0 and 2 pi, we can draw this curve and it is still a function. For every input, there is exactly one output. We can draw a surface of a sphere and it is, well, we can draw the surface of a sphere with a function where for every input there is, is an output, a single output. So you can draw the North Pole and the South Pole, right, with two different values of u and v. They, they don't require the same, and it's like plus or minus. That's all out the window. It's truly a function. This is a great thing that you can do that. So we aren't ready for derivatives. That's what we'll talk about next. Now we need a worksheet. The worksheet, what we're going to do is we're going to practice coming up with the parametric surface representations for some of the common surfaces that we're going to see. Because all these problems, what we're going to be doing is trying to do some calculus with them, but you've got to be able to write down the actual equation of the surface or you can't do anything. So here's my handout. Pass these back. Pass a couple over there, please. There should be enough there. If there's extras, just leave them on the table. So let's please look at example A. Example A, 
let me see if I have this file. I think I do. Yes, I do. Here's example A. Y'all see it? Now, the red is the x-axis. The green is the y-axis, and the blue is the z-axis. How many of y'all ever heard RGB? Red, green, blue? It's like a computer term, RGB, right? Visual, audio-visual stuff. That's the way I have done my axes in the past. X, Y, Z, RGB, red, green, blue. So that way we can all remember it. Um, so that, that's just from here on out from, for, this, for these examples. When you see red, green, blue, that's X, Y, Z. All right. So what I have is I have a solid disk, right? I have a solid disk. I would like for us to draw this solid disk. It has a radius of 2 but the disk is in the XZ plane, right? It's in the XZ plane. So let's talk about how we can draw this. What I want to come up with, for example, A, is a vector function, R of UV, where I have three components. And when I let my U and V vary, between two things, I will draw the solid disk. Not just the circle, everything inside of it. So, any ideas? Why is zero? Good, I'm glad you said that first. Why has it got to be zero, right? I mean, that never changes in the problem. Your Y coordinate is always zero on this disk. No matter where you are, Right? No matter where you are, y is 0. Yes, it's the same thing. It is a circle, so it is 2 in each direction. Okay, so the idea here, I think you're right on this. You can draw a circle. You can draw the outer edge, right? It would be a fixed radius of what, 2? And then it would be like 2 cosine theta sine theta, right? But we do not not using theta. So I could say something like um, 2 uh, cosine u sine u. And those would be my x and z components, right? But that would only draw me the outer edge. I don't want just the outer edge. I want the outer edge and every radius all the way down to what? Zero, right? So I need to control that radius. And I have a variable still that I get to a free choice to do whatever I want with. So if I make this x component cosine u, and I make the, y, the z component, sorry, sine u, that'll draw me circles. But now I need the radius to be varied, right? I need to vary the radius, which is the number in front, and I can use the V to control that. Does that make sense? U is going to draw me the circle. It's going to give me the cosine sine circles. The V will adjust this. So I need to let my U go between where and where? 0 to 2 pi. Pardon me? Uh, which ones? Exactly 2. Oh, well, 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 that's what I'm about to do with V. I'm going to let my V vary between 0 and 2. You see? So think about this. Let's, let's start with this. I'm going to let V, I'm going to hold V constant at 0, right? If I hold V at 0, what does this draw? 0, 0, 0, right? It's just the origin. Okay, now let's let V be, and let's not go through all the Vs. I mean, like, we can't do that. But let's just pick a nice one. How about one half? So I move V to one half. Now I have one half cosine U, zero, one half sine U. That draws me a circle, right, in the XZ plane with a radius of one half. Now I move V to one, and it draws me a circle radius one in the XZ plane. Then I move it to one and a half, and then I move it to two. So I draw all of them, right? So I get all these circles. It fills in the entire disk. Make sense? We good? That's it. That's the vector equation. That will draw you this. 
So we're looking for the vector, the vector equation, which means we'll have to have an X, a Y, and a Z component for each one. We will be needing controls on U and V for all these problems. Let's go to example B. Now for this one, we have a tetrahedron So let me just kind of spin this thing around for you so you can see it, All right? Okay, tetrahedron. This tetrahedron has four face surfaces, right? It has the bottom, it has the back sides, and it has this front face that's at an angle, correct? We need to come up with parametric equations for each of the four surfaces, because there are four surfaces, right? They're all different. I need four separate vector equations, one for each surface. Now, why? Because what we're going to do later is we're going to have a vector field, and this surface is going to be in that vector field. And we're going to be trying to measure the flow through this surface. So that's called flux. Physics, flux, people, okay? You have to measure the, the flow through a surface. So we measure this thing, called, this thing called flux. And so to do that, we need to know how to represent the surface as a vector function first. We need that, or else we can't do flux. So let's go ahead and try and look at each of these. Now I'm going to draw my own picture which I'm sure will be much nicer than that one. Right. Okay. What were the vertices? Zero, zero. Let me see. The Z one was two. And on the X it was three. Let me start with that surface first. There's four of them, right? I'm going to just do this one first. Of course, this is X, Y, and Z. I'm doing the right-hand rule. Well, that's, that's, that's like a plane, isn't it? That's a flat sheet, right? It uh, it's, lives in the X, Z plane. So the y, the y is always zero. So let me, let me write this down. My R... I'm going to call this S1, subscript S1. My R of UV, so this is the vector equation of surface, that's S, surface 1, which I'm just choosing for it to be that one, is equal to the Z, I mean, sorry, the Y component's always 0. And then what about... What about the uh, X component? Your X, your X coordinate on this, in this yellow place is between 0 and 3, right? Now, what I want you to start think, looking at this like is almost like, remember when we had like type 1 regions, type 2 regions? This is like a type 1 region. Our X is between two constants, but our, not our Y's, our Z's are between two functions of X, aren't they? Like how high you go up here depends on how far you are, how far out you are on X. Do you all agree with that? What I'm trying to get you to see is, is be careful to not do this. Some people will say, I'm going to let that be, let my X be U. Don't write this down. I'm going to let my X be U. I'm going to let my, my Z be V. I'm going to say that U is between 0 and 3. I'm going to let my V be between, well, what's my highest point here? 2? So 0 and 2. What's wrong with that? That draws you a rectangle, right? Yeah, it draws you the actual rectangle. That includes this piece, which you don't want. So you can't just let V be, go whatever and do whatever the hell it wants. V somehow has to be 
a function of you also, right? So the question is, where do you put that control? And I'm going to put that control down here, all right? I'm going to put a restriction on V down here. What's my restriction on V? Well, V must be between zero, which is the ground, right? And how high can it go? Well, that depends on how where X is, right? So what is this equation of this line right here? What's the slope of that line? Now be careful because you're you're looking at it like this. Here's x, here's z. Right? It goes out to three, comes up to two. So this is z equals what? Negative two thirds x plus two. Isn't it? If you look at this right here, this line. You have to look at it from like the back side where your positive x is going in this direction, positive z is in this direction. Then the, the, the z-intercept of that line is 2. The slope is down 2 over 3, so that's negative 2. Y'all following that or not? So your v here is, is going to be between 0 and what? Negative 2 thirds x, but I can't use x because x is v, right? So u plus 2. Make sense? All right, let's let's try another one. Uh, how about that back side? That other back side. It looked like this. It was still up there at two, but didn't it go out four on the y-axis? So there's y-axis. Here's my z-axis. Here's my x, and it came out four. So I'm trying to come up with the equation of this plane which is very sim similar to what we just did, isn't it? This would be R, I'll call this one S2, of S2, RS2 of UV is, what's always going to stay the, uh, the same here? The X is always what? Zero? Yes? So X is always zero. Now, this time, my Y and my Z, I can let my Y be, what, U again? Let it vary between 0 and 4? And let my V be my Z component, but I've got to make sure that, that Z component, V, stays between where and where. What's the smallest that you want your Z to be? 0, and then your... Highest is going to be this written as a function, right? So, again, define this line. What's this line going to be? Z is negative 1 half Y plus 2, right? That's what this is. But then replace your Y with U, right? So you're going to be between negative 1 half Y plus 2. Do you all follow that or not? You can always try and check it, right? You can fix something and see what happens. Like, let's let u be 0. If u is 0, then what? v is between what? 0 and 2, right? Understand? So if I let my u be 0, that's my, my y component is 0. It's right here. My x is always 0, so I'm right here. And now my v can go between 0 and 2. So I go up and down. I draw that, right? Now let u be 2. If I let u be 2, this becomes, what, negative 1, and then plus 2 is going to be 1. So now my v can go between 0 and 1. So at u is 2, it goes between 0 and 1. And it would do that the whole way through, right? If u is 4, 
this is going to be, what is that, zero, right? So V is between zero and zero. That means V is zero, so you're stuck right there. So you can kind of check these. Questions? How about the bottom? Z is zero. Be careful, though. Z is zero. Okay, yes, that's one part, but we still need to draw the rest, right? Okay. So the bottom looks like this. We know it hit at four here. We know it hit at what? Two here? Was it two or three? It was two. Three here and then two up here, right? Although that doesn't matter. So we're looking at the bottom one. It looks like this. Now we're in the XY plane, right? That's in the XY plane. So really, if I drew that over here, it's X, here's Y. It's up here. Here's 3. And over here, it's 4. So this is Y equals negative 4 thirds X plus 4. So I'm going to let my third surface be a vector function. We said the z component's always going to be 0. The x component's going to be my u. The y component's going to be my v. My u is between what? Z 0 and 3 for the, what's that? That's right. You could do it either way. There's no wrong. There's no wrong way. What's being mentioned is that you could have let your u be between zero and four and make it your y component, and then re, then write your x component as a function of that instead. Either way, you can draw the same thing, and that's up to you. I'm just choosing to do it this way. Uh, so this will be between zero and negative four thirds u plus four. All right. Now, the more difficult part, which is the actual face of that surface, right? That face. So the fourth one, let me just bring up the picture. I'm talking about, it's hard to, hard to show you what I'm talking about. Talking about this this triangle right here it comes down over back up right this so if I look at that if I look at it from the top and I'm trying to orient this thing so I have the x and y axes So the red is my X, right? Green is my Y. Looking straight down on this, I, I do have kind of a type 1 region, right? I have my, my X is between two constants. My Y is between two functions of X. So I could set it up just the way I set up the base, right? Just a second ago. What's the only difference? The Z values are not flat, right? The Z values depend on the x and the y. It depends on where I am. If my x is here and my y is here, then I'm a certain height. If I'm, my x is here and my y is here, I'm a different height. Yes? How do you get that? How do you get how high that is? Where do you get that from? Wouldn't it be nice if we knew the equation of this surface? The equation of the plane? How can we get the equation of the plane? Cross product, two vectors, get the normal, right? And do all that stuff, and we get the equation of the plane. I'm not going to go through the work. I already have it worked out, okay? So let me just tell you what the surface of, what the equation of that surface is. Let me see. I think I did it. Yes. Okay. So on the last one, we have this, this, and this. We're trying to find this surface here. So
So the vector function for that fourth surface will be, oh, let me tell you what the equation of that plane is. I already got it. It's 4x plus 3y plus 6z equals 12. That is the equation of that plane. So what we could do is we could let our, our x and our y components be exactly what, what they were here, right? Because this draws the base of the surface. This draws the base of the, the x and the y components should not change. It's the z part that's changing, right? So it should be the same u that we had from before, the v that we had from before. Our restrictions are still the same. It's just that my z component needs to be controlled by these two. So all I need to do is go up to this equation, right? Solve it for z. And I'll have it in terms of x and y. And x and y are basically the u and the v. Right? So solve that thing for z. If you solve this for z, z is equal to 2 minus 2 thirds u minus 1 half v. Okay, so I solved this, I solved this for z, and I replaced with x and y with u and v because that's what they were here. And now that's going to be my z component, which is going to come in here, 2 minus 2 thirds u minus 1 half v. Questions? We're all good or no? I'm just going to check to see if it works. I'm just going to pick one point. I'm going to let I'm going to let u be three. If u is three, where am I here? Remember, u is x, right? So if if u is three, then I'm coming out right here, right? What should my v be? should be zero, right? Or my bounds on, look at it. If, if u is three, plugging three in here, I get what? Zero. So v goes between zero and zero. So I'm right here. X is three, my y is zero. And then my z should also be zero. Let's just check it. If I plug three in here, what happens? Three right there gives me two minus two. And then what was v? We said v was zero. So that, I mean, I'm just checking one point. It doesn't convince me that I'm not super happy like it's for sure, but I, at least I know it checks out at that point. It makes me feel better. All right. So we have found the four parametric equations for the four surfaces, and we're done with that problem. Questions? Next one. Example C, find the vector function r of uv which yields the cylinder shown here. It's hollow. Red, green, blue. Look at it from the side so you can see what number that is there. It's hard to see it. Actually, it's hard for me to see it. I believe this goes one, two, three, four. Left and right here, like this, it goes from one to four. See, it's not the entire cylinder. It's just that part right there. So it goes from one to four. It goes from one to four down the y-axis, right? The y values are between one and four. How do you think I'm going to do this?
This is similar to the disk problem that we just had with, with one difference. And then I really want to see if you understand this. What's that? It, it's hollow, right? So with, to get the disk, remember, I had to draw the circles first, which ate up the U variable, right? Then I used the V variable to control the radius. So to get the disk, I had to be able to draw the circle, which required one variable, and then the other variable was used for the radius. Here, I don't need to control the radius, do I? It's a fixed radius on the circle. But what I need to do is move that circle back and forth. So I'm going to use one variable to draw the circle at a fixed radius. I'm going to use the other con circle to control back and forth with that. Does that make sense? OK. So looking at it from this perspective right here, that circle has a radius 1. OK. I'm always going to be drawing circles with radius 1 that are in the what plane or parallel to what plane? The the X, Z plane. The circles are going to be in the X, Z plane, so to speak, but going back and forth. Yes? How do I draw circles in the X, Z plane? Cosine, I use the X and the Z, right? I use cosine and sine in the X and Z components. This example, what's example C? D? Okay. C? D? C? C. D looks like C. It's a little lot. It's a little different. So example C. I'm going to want my R of U V to be equal to. Okay. I want to draw circles in the X Z plane with radius one. So I'm going to say cosine U sine U. That'll draw me circles, won't it? Radius one. Those circles will run kind of, if you want to say, parallel to the XZ plane. But what about your Y coordinate? What's that? Let that be V, right? That's the thing you want to control. You want to, that'll give you your back and forth. So you want your U to go between what? 0, 2 pi. And you want your V to go between where? 1 and 4. That's it. So if you let V be 1, what happens? You draw a circle, but it's moved out the y-axis 1. You let V be 2, you draw another circle, move it out 2. You take everything between 1 and 2, you draw the cylinder. Hollowed out, right? Questions? Example T, D. Find the vector function R of U V, which yields the red end cap of the cylinder shown here. The red end cap. Just that disk. It's just that disk. It's the disk we drew earlier with one exception. Y would be 3. Well, was it 3 or 4? Four? 4, Y would be 4, right? So it's that same disk we drew earlier but we bring it out now. So this should be example D would be R of U V equals, what was it? Wasn't it V cosine U? Right? V sine U? Right. This is the first example. See, different because it's the one that's the solid disk. We want to be able to control the radius, but it's the y coordinate coordinate that never changes. It's always fixed at four. And then our u's between zero and two pi, and our v is between what zero and one for this, right? Because our our radius. I think so. Let me bring that picture back up. Yeah, our radius here was between was was one. Sorry.
What would happen if I wanted to do another end cap? Oh, well, I think I have it on the next one, right? No? I don't have another one. Where the heck is the picture here? Hold on, I'm missing a picture. Oh, I'm just not showing it. I don't know why it wasn't being shown. Okay, but look, let me just ask you real quick. What if I wanted the other end cap, the one right here? Well, that has a Y coordinate of 1. So it would be the same formula, right? Same exact formula with a 1 there. And if you did that, then you would have the entire cylinder, right? The surfaces of the entire cylinder, the two end caps and the outside. So if you had the whole thing and you could look at the flux, again, that's later. We have to be able to get all the surfaces defined first. All right, example D, or E, I don't believe you have a picture for. Red, green, blue. This is all out of whack. Oh, crap. There we go. All right. Trying to turn this space around here. Okay. Wow. Looks a lot different on your thing than it does on mine. Can y'all tell what that is? Do you have this picture? You do? Okay. Yeah. Well, let's just... Geometrically, okay, geometrically, what is this here? And we want to look at the entire three surfaces. So I say there's three surfaces here, right? It, this is our cylinder, isn't it, that we just had? Except that someone's come through and they've, they've like sliced it. And where they sliced it at an angle, they've created this new surface. We still have like a, like a back end cap, right? We still have a back end cap on that. We also have the blue cylinder with the cut. So do you all see the three surfaces? Yes? Now, I need, to, I need to tell you what cut this, okay, because we cut it with a plane, and I need to tell you what it is in order for you to do this problem. All right, so let me tell you what that is, and I'll tell you it's up here somewhere. Hold on. Hopefully I have it defined. Okay, it is x minus y plus z equals 2. Terrible. Strike that. Hold on. That's not correct. It's uh, put X minus Z. X, X plus Z or plus Y minus Z equals 2. What did I just say? X plus y minus z equals 2. Yes, there we go. That's the plane. And now the radius of this thing, what was the radius for my picture? 1. You'll see that? 1.
So the radius here is 1. All right, let's start with the easiest part of this thing. What, what do you think is the easiest part of this? The disk on the, the back side of it, right? Okay, what's the, what is the uh, vector equation? I'll call that S1 of that back disk. Okay, so what do you say that the x is which? Is, what do you want it to be? V cosine u. Is that what I heard? Yes. All right. And then what about the y component? It's it is on the x z plane. So zero. And then v sine u. Right. Use between 0 and 2 pi. V is between 0 and, I think the radius here was 1. Yeah, radius is 1 here. Okay, so that gives me that back side. That's S1. That's back here, S1. What do you want to do next? You want to do the cylinder? Yes? Cylinder's tricky. It's a little tricky. See if you can figure out how to do that one. Calling this S2. What what never changes on that cylinder? What's always the same? If I look at this cylinder, no matter where I'm drawing it, right? Even over here where we cut part of it off, right? I mean, if you look at it from this perspective, every point on that cylinder, every point on that cylinder has to lie on this circle, right? In other words, in the XZ perspective, the X and Z will always be somewhere on that circle. Yes? Now, it's the Y co coordinate or the, you know, the Y value that changes. Yes? So, do you agree that I could just draw a circle radius 1 in the X, Z plane? Start with that. So, R of S2 of UV or just draw me unit circles in the x, z plane. Those are my unit circles. Now, as far as the y component, how far out you are going to be allowed to go, that's going to change, isn't it? That's going to, that's going to depend on where you are, right? So how am I going to say that? What's that? Between zero and the equation of the plane. Okay, so you're saying that if I pick a U, right, then I'm going to be somewhere on this circle, and then, then the distance I'm allowed to travel. So let's say I pick a U and I'm on this circle right here, this one particular slice, I pick a particular U and I'm right there at that point, right? Let's just say, I am now asking how far am I allowed to move in this direction, right? I can only go from the bottom, which is zero, to, you said, the plane, right? The plane. So why don't I let my back and forth be V and let V go between 0 and the plane, yes? Okay, so my V, this is going to be V. I already said my U over here is going to be between 0 and 2 pi. But my V cannot just be whatever the hell it wants. In fact, my V is not between two constants, is it? 
My V is between zero and some function of what? This plane is this plane this way is a function of which two one which two variables? X and Z. X and Z. Not X and Y. Do y'all see that? So I need to take this equation here and solve it for Y. And this will give me two minus X plus Z. So for me down here, my V has to be between zero and whatever this is, but what's X and Z for me? Cosine U is X and sine U is Z. So this is going to be two minus X, which is cosine U, plus Z, which is sine U. There it is. Do you all see that? Questions? Sure. All right, let's move to the next one, S3, which I'll call this one. That's your S3. So R of S3 of UV is, so tell me about this piece here. Again, I'll, I'll, if I'm looking at it from this perspective right here, from the edge like this, it just looks like a disc, doesn't it? It's the outside, everything in, right? It's, it's everything in here. The only thing that needs to change is that as I'm drawing in, right, the Y part coming out at me is, is different, right? It varies. So I still want to draw the disk. I just want to change the Y value back and forth. So how can I draw the disk? The solid disk. V cosine U for the X and then V sine U for the Z, right? That'll draw me my and my U here is between what? 0, 2 pi and my V here is between 0 and 1. See, I have no choice. If I'm going to draw the disk, these have to be between these constants, right? That draws me disk. What I haven't told you is where to put it in terms of the back and forth on the Y axis. But it has to live on the plane, right? has to be on the plane the whole time. So it has to satisfy the plane equation in that y component. So that would be what? 2 minus x, which is v cosine u minus, or no, plus, right? Plus z, which would be v sine u. You see the difference between that one and the previous one? It's subtle, but there's a difference. See, you have to draw the disk, which makes you eat up both your variables on, the, on these two pieces. That's the only way you can draw the disk. So that, that tells you your restrictions on your variables have to be between those two constants. So now you've got to make that Y component work out. The other one was, was different, right? You still had that additional variable? You hadn't eaten them both up yet? I hope that makes sense. Are there any more? Do you have this one? Hmm. There's no others? 
E. Oh, yeah, you have F and G. Let's make F and G take-home problems to be turned in next time for uh, a quiz grade. How many of you um, are going to be here for Thanksgiving uh, class? I mean, be here. Are you all planning on being here? I I'm going to be here no matter what. Hmm? Well, I mean, on, on Wednesday, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to be here, all right? I mean, I know historically it's hard to get people to come to school, um, but I'm giving, a te I'm giving tests on Wednesday which the class voted, my classes voted for that. They wanted that, so um, they prefer that before, than after. So I'm going to be here. I have a class before yours and after yours, so I'm going to be here. So I do plan on lecturing. Um, if you're not here because of family-related stuff, then you'll need to somehow get this to me electronically. Right? Not, not a picture texted to me, like an official email through Canvas with the answers to this, all right? So what I need to do is I need to give you the actual equations because you can't tell from here what the equations of these things are, all right? So let me give those to you. You have the pictures though, right? So for this one, uh, this is Z. equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared. So it's a surface. So what I want for that one are the two surfaces here. There's, there's like a top cap, and then there's a bottom cap. Do you all see that? The radius of the bottom cap is 1. So that one should be pretty trivial, hopefully, at this point. Remember the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. All right? Can I move on to the next one? All right, the next one here is... Try a decent drawing of this. Not a very good drawing. Uh, yeah, that's terrible, actually. Because it cuts back, right? That's a little better. Is that a little better for you? Okay. So this right here satisfies the equation z is equal to 1 minus x squared. This face right here satisfies the equation um, y plus z equals 2. And what else do you need to know? Is the back flat? Um, I believe it is. I'll double check it. You all got that, though? The back is flat, yes. Looks like you look at it from the top here, that thing curves down and hits at 1. But this is not a cylinder. That's not a cylinder up there. This part right here on the top is not a cylinder, which means you can't draw it with cosine sine. But just follow the same method, see if you can figure these out. So what I want, so there's no confusion, is Wednesday, beginning of class, or emailed to me before class starts. Um, the vector equations, which represents the surfaces for each of these figures. So on the problem before this, you're going to have two vector equations with their domains stated and everything. And then on this one, you're going to have a, um, what, one, two, Three and four, the bottom. Don't forget the bottom of this thing. All right. Don't make the bottom harder than it is. All right. The bottom is pretty, pretty trivial. All right. So turn those in beginning of class or email to me through Canvas for a quiz grade. 
That's it. We haven't even started 13.6. Like we've just begun. So we'll spend, I'll spend Wednesday going through the rest of 13.6. We still have 13.7, 13.8, and 13.9. So that's, remember I told you all 13.6 always slows us down because we have to spend so much time on just getting acquainted with parametric surfaces first. All right. Adios. Have a good one.